My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. This is your host, Era. Today, I'm excited to have uh, Ravi Srinivasan um, on the podcast. Uh, I'm excited just because he, he works for TIFF, and I'm a huge movie guy. Every year I'm at TIFF for at least 15 movies. Uh, this year, not as much, but Ravi is an arts creator and he's based in Toronto. Uh, he's got over eight years of experience programming award-winning films and discovering new talent. And he has a proven track record of delivering entertaining and meaningful work to audiences across Canada. So just some of the key experiences are he's a Canadian features programmer for TIFF, um, as, as well as an international features programmer for Hot Docs. And on top of that, he's also the founder and executive director of the Southwestern International Film Festival. So film is in his blood. So I'm excited to kind of dig further, hear a story. So Ravi, welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you on here. Um, I'd like to start at the beginning. So why don't we kick off things with telling us about you know, your family, your upbringing, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Sarah, Ara, for having me on. Uh, looking forward to this. Um, so I grew up in Sarnia, Ontario, which uh, is a border city with Port Huron, Michigan. It's about an hour drive uh, to Detroit, three hours southwest of Toronto. Um, my father uh, is originally from India, uh, Madras, and my mother is from the Philippines, uh, Davao. Uh, particularly. So uh, they both met uh, in college at Waterloo. And um, yeah, they were both involved in science and sort of the the petrochemical boom that happened in uh, southwestern Ontario in the 70s and 80s. And um, yeah, there was a lot of work uh, down in Sarnia at that time. So they settled in Sarnia, uh, had two boys. I'm the youngest child, my brother, older brother, Hari, is uh, 11 years my senior and um yeah that's sort of like my where i grew up uh, i was very one of uh, only two non-white families growing up in uh, actually a, a suburb of sarnia i guess called corona so there was like we were like the brown family and then like right behind us was the black family and uh yeah we actually like hung out my mom worked with his dad the older son in that family used to like have to walk me home from school, things like that. So it was, you know, it was quite a unique experience. I think at the time, didn't really understand the context of it, but obviously as you get older, you kind of realize the sort of weight and that that has on, uh, on you growing up and how that shaped you and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting that you talk about films in my blood. I would, I would actually say there it's, funny to try to uncover how, uh, where film and arts, be, uh, you know, how that came in my blood, because uh, at least to my knowledge, both my parents were not really arts orientated at all, uh, at least professionally. I've been told in, in recent years that there was some sort of creative juices flowing uh, in my father that, you know, was sort of like a bit of an outlet for him. But yeah, that's sort of the upbringing. And um, I went to yeah, I went to high school, went to a Catholic high school, uh, not a practicing Catholic at all, but that was sort of, you know, the good high school uh, in the town in Sarnia. Um, and yeah, I was always involved in like theater, public speaking. Uh, I went to like the provincials for public speaking in grade six. So speaking in front of an audience and like where you saw, you know, you saw you went to a Q&A for Night Raiders and like it's sort of just always been... Uh, something I've been good at and something that I've uh, enjoyed. And um, yeah, university, I, I actually was studying journalism to begin my university career. I ended up dropping out and taking a, sec a semester off and figuring out that, you know, I really wanted to pursue film, love film, grew up on film. I, I always say that the television and film, you know, VHS has sort of helped raise me. Um, and yeah, you know, I went to film school at Laurier, then uh, did like a postgraduate at Sheridan College in Toronto and just sort of step by step uh, found different jobs and eventually got into film programming or curation uh, around um, about the third year out of film school. Yeah, so I, I mean, 
I'm, I'm always happy to talk to other people that are passionate about films because I enjoyed films or movies kind of growing up, but I think really going to my first TIFF film festival, I think it was Midnight Madness. We got like the Midnight Madness pack. And that really kind of, you know, once you go through that experience and you, you're you watching the story or stories with other people that, especially the Midnight Madness crowd, which is like really rowdy, uh, it really kind of brings out something in you. So um, I read something kind of about, you know, uh, I'm always curious about first jobs in like your, you know, particular industry. And I read your first story and I want you to share that with the audience of kind of how you broke into the film industry with new real films. Tell us how you got that job because I, I, I find it very inspirational. Yeah, breaking into the film industry can be, it can be daunting a lot. I, I talk to a lot of young people coming out of school about, you know, how did you get, how did you get there? What did you do? And so for that particular experience, I mean, part of the, um, part of what I had to do at Sheridan College was to find an internship. So I essentially just got like a book from the Toronto International Film Festival and it has like all of the film companies that are sort of, you know, registered in their industry. And it has like their contact numbers in there because, you know, they're expect they, they want phone calls for like films, filmmakers, like people who want to work with them. But I just like circled all of the Toronto downtown based companies and I started cold emailing and cold calling a few of them, like I probably a couple dozen. And New Real Films, I looked them up. They were a small independent film company, you know, low budget feature films, but they had gone, they had had success at TIFF. They, uh, I think at that time, like three, they had gotten a film into TIFF uh, three or four years in a row. Uh, films that I hadn't seen though, or heard of. And, but I looked, you know, they were located uh, in Little Italy College and Crawford and very close walking distance to where my apartment was. So I was like, well, this would be like a perfect fit. And so I just emailed them and said, hey, like I'm, you know, in film school and looking for an internship and, you know, just try, like, I think I dropped something funny. Like I'm really good at like getting coffees for people. And the producer, Jennifer Jonas, uh, you know, wrote me back and said, hey, like, yeah, we'd love to meet with you. And you know, don't worry, we get our own coffee kind of thing, <laughs> uh, which is funny because she said that, but that actually wasn't true. <laughs> uh, I still had to get them coffee, but it actually ended up being uh, a really good experience, good learning experience, um, a good foot in the door. It was a great thing to put on my resume because a lot of people knew who Jennifer was in the industry. So I think being able to put that uh, on my resume or as a reference really like helped lead to the next job. Uh, and then, you know, the next shot. So um, I guess the lesson from that is to, you know, that I tell people is like, don't be afraid, like, you know, like cold calling and cold emailing, I think is a bit of a lost art these days. Um, and I think you have to be assertive, uh, especially like if you don't know anyone, like, I think that's like, one of the aspects that I kind of hang my hat on a little bit and I know others who are in my situation also feel the same way it's like I didn't I didn't get these jobs because of any form of like nepotism or privilege or anything like that and I'm like whatever privilege like I kind of hate the word privilege now to be honest but like but it is true like you know I don't I didn't know one person in the industry like I didn't have family or a friend like it was literally like like obviously now I know a lot of people and those have helped me get other things for sure. But I think starting off like to be able to be like, yeah, like I hustled hard to get, to do all these things on my own. That's like the one thing like that I, uh, that I'm proud of, I guess. Yeah. I really want to highlight that story just because exactly what you said, I feel like cold email, cold calls are like a lost art. I mean, yeah, you know, if you have a network, you can definitely leverage that. But I feel like a lot of people feel like things should be easy. And I feel like sometimes you have to step outside your comfort zone to get things that you want. I'm not saying everyone's guaranteed that, but at least put in that effort. And I just really yeah. love that fact. Like for me, if I see somebody interesting, yeah, I try to see if somebody knows them. But for me, I'm like, if I want to like really meet somebody, I'm going to like email them, follow them, like figure out a way to get to them. Because like, if you really care about something, you'll find that extra, you know, like you'll take that extra effort to, you know, connect with that person and that person will see that from your effort as well. Even if they don't want to like want to talk to you, they're like, oh, you know what? This person found out my favorite coffee and delivered it to my office. But then, mm -hmm. you know, that took some effort. Let me give them five minutes of my time. And then it's on yeah. you to take that opportunity and make it into a bigger opportunity. So I just I just love that story. Um, 
and that kind of goes into the next part, which is, you know, obviously, how did the opportunity with TIFF come apart, uh, come about? And then I would love to kind of delve into, you know, the idea of film festivals and, you know, their importance in kind of the, you know, in the world of movies and film as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll be quite honest with you. I think like growing up in Sarnia, like I didn't really understand, like I didn't really fully know like what TIFF was. Like, I, to be honest, hadn't, didn't even hear about TIFF like until I got to um, shared it. And you know what I mean? It's like, it, and it sounds like crazy. Like, you know, I know lots of people who've been like going to TIFF since they were like six, seven, because they grew up in Toronto, but it's just not something that I heard about. And like the whole idea and concept of film, fe film festivals, like, you know, I'd heard of con and, you know, like that sort of lavish, like European kind of film festival atmosphere and experience. But um, so TIFF was like a new thing to me. And, but once I got started working with New Real Films, they had a film that was premiering. So I, I, I got hired or I started working with them as an intern in the spring. And then they had a film that was, that got into TIFF in, in that September. So then, you know, I fully, you know, started to see the scope and the importance and the influence that it has on um, the film industry. And especially if you're just like a small little film, like how much that elevates and like the kind of platform that it gives you. Um, and then, you know, so after New Real Films, the money had actually run out. So like, I was like, I was working for free. And then like, I ended up finding this, like uh, this government sort of subsidized, like fun to like basically keep my job there. Cause like, I love the experience, but then that money ran out and they were like, Hey, like we can't really like pay you anymore kind of thing. So I was like looking for a new gig. I got a job with this company called real Canada. They're like a national organization that helps to uh, bolster Canadian films by showing them to high school students and new Canadian audiences across the country, like setting up little mini festivals. So that, with that experience, I got, you know, one, I got to really get to know the Canadian film landscape, like who all the players were, the film history behind it, like all these films that I had missed that I never got exposed to growing up. So I started becoming an expert in Canadian film. And I started curating little festivals for different organizations across the country of Canadian film. And then I started, you know, and kudos to Real Canada for allowing, like I essentially, like I asked them for the opportunities. Like I could have just kind of stuck to like my little coordinating job, but I was like, hey, I'm really good at interviewing people. Like, give me a shot. Cause it used to just be the executive director who would interview everybody. And I was like, hey, and he was starting to get really busy. And he, I could tell like, he didn't really like want to do it anymore. Like go on stage. Like it was a bit of a chore for him. So I was like, hey, I'll do it. Like I'm good at, you know, and they were like, okay, let's give him a shot. And they saw that I was like, you know, I'm kind of a natural at doing it. And they're like, okay, this is like, I don't have to do this anymore. Great. And so I got experience interviewing, like doing festival style Q and A's with Canadian filmmakers, et cetera. So I was able to then put that all on my resume. And then this opportunity came about with TIFF and I was still working with uh, Real Can at the time, but I was at this point where I was getting a little unhappy with uh, the role there um and sort of a little bit butting heads with some a uh, couple of people new people so that actually caused me to start like looking for a job and then i this opportunity came and i interviewed and i interviewed for the position to be cameron bailey's assistant uh programming associate so it's a big job a big job that like people would be lining up like around the corner to do yeah. um and essentially i didn't get the job I, I, and then I, and I, I, I agree with that assessment. I think at that time I wasn't ready for that type of role just in terms of like my knowledge and experience in world cinema. Um, but they were like, Hey, we really like you though. We have this other gig that we think you'll be better suited for. And that's working under the Canadian programmer, Steve Gravestock. And I was like, yeah, of course, let's do it. So I took this job and then I was like, Hey, real Kim, I, got this job and they were like what you were looking for another job and they were they were they were at the end of the day happy for me because they also saw it as like oh like one of our employees is now like in the door at tiff because they need they also want to work with tiff and they sh you know they want that access too so they actually allowed me to leave and go work for tiff because it's a contract gig so I was able to do both, which was perfect for me. Cause like, that's like a stable job the rest of the year where this is an opportunity that is like a, you know, a contract gig that you would never want to pass up in this industry, but it wasn't secure. Like I didn't really, wouldn't have had 
guaranteed work to pay the bills. So it worked out great. And I'm, yeah, I'm actually still working for both of those companies. And, um, but yeah, that's how I got in the door TIFF. And, you know, I, I was a programming associate or assistant under C for, I think, four years or five years. And now I'm programming Canadian films with Steve. So, you know, it's, I've been on the TIFF programming team since the 2013. And as an assistant, yeah, so I started programming in, I think, uh, 19. So I was, you know, in an assistant type role. And I had an assistant Cameron do looking at South Asian films for a bit, Filipino films, because I'm not Filipino. And um, yeah, that's sort of my TIFF uh, career in a nutshell. How do you get interviewed for these roles when you said that, you know, you're, you agreed with their assessment that you didn't have the knowledge at that time? Like, how did they test you on this? Like, or like, how did they yeah. evaluate this? I'm curious. Yeah, so the initial interview process was to review two films. So like, pick any two films and, and give us your critique on them. Um, and so I think sort of uh, intuitively, I think I picked the right two films that they were looking for. And so what I did was, I don't even know if this is how they do the process now, um, but I picked two films that they had just programmed at TIFF. And I gave a positive review on one and I gave a very negative review on one. And I think, you know, they looked at that as like, you know, that's good, like critical analysis. Because if you're just giving two positive reviews of films that they pick, it's kind of like, well, you know, you're just uh, patting, patting ourselves on the back kind of thing. So I think they took that. I think it was a good strategy, at least in hindsight, when I look back on that. Um, but it just, and then you get into the interview phase, like asking me a lot of, cause like Cameron is the artistic director at the time, well, he still is now and he's a co-head, but like, you know, he deals with a wide spectrum of international cinema. And I just didn't have the breadth of knowledge to cover that wide of the spectrum and like, and, and somebody else did. And I think when I look back, I'm like, yeah, that was the right decision. But I think now, you know, um, I've, I've gained so much knowledge experience and, um, you know, if it were me myself with what I have now applying, you know, that would be, a different, I think it would be a different story. How did, um, like, what's your day-to-day -day look like with TIFF, like, um, when, in, your, in your role as a programmer? Now? Like, what exactly do you do? How do you go about doing it? And, like, what do you find the most difficult part of that job? This episode is sponsored by Nobody. That's right, Nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. Yeah, the, so the day-to-day -day of a programmer is, um, you know, you spend like the first uh, like four or five months in lead-ups to the festival. So the festivals in September basically start like end of April, beginning of May. We start watching films like nonstop, nonstop submissions, anywhere from, you know, three to seven films a day potentially. And, um, you know, writing, you know, writing notes and going back and forth with fellow programmers and talking about these films that also that other your colleagues have seen and uh, and really start mapping out the kind of films that you're going to select and building your lineup. That's kind of what happens. It's like, I mean, and it sounds glamorous. And like, I think people, a lot of people who aren't in the industry are like, oh, you get to watch films for a living. That's so cool. It's like, yeah, it's, it, it is really cool. Like when they're good and <laughs> when they're great and when you discover, you know, an amazing new filmmaker, like in a, an incredible new story or innovative story but um you know there it's like any you know i i try to give it context you know it's like if you were um if you were curating a lineup of like 20 of the best chefs in toronto and every chef was you know s inviting you to sit down or like whatever you know like you're gonna probably try a whole bunch of like terrible meals or if you're curating a music festival and you were taking like open submissions, everyone's sending you their mixtape or their, you know, like their band camp uh, listing, you're gonna listen to a lot of music that's just not very high quality. And so that, that happens um, with being a curator or programmer with film as well. So the day-to-day -day is watching films, making notes, you know, putting together your lineup. And then the festival is, you know, of course, introducing films, uh, hosting filmmakers that are from out of town or even, you know, from in town, taking them out, introducing them to other filmmakers, other industry folks like sales agents, distributors, uh, actors, things like that. So um, you become like a, you go from curator to kind of being just like a really good like host and um, kind of an event manager. 
what's like a, a film that you discovered in your time at TIFF doing this role that you're like most proud of discovering or like, you know, revealing to the world? Yeah, there's been, um, there's been a few, I guess, like there was a film before I became a programmer um, that I was really passionate about, like I was the assistant. So but your job as the programming associate is to sort of re like rec films that are sort of, you know, blind submitted to like recommend them up to the main programmers. So like the first few years, it's like, it was hard to like get a film that like I saw first to be like, hey, you guys should look at this. And then they take it. Like, I think the first three years, like none of, I hadn't, didn't have success. Cause like, they're all getting films from like previous directors that have been in the festival or like big companies and, you know, and the slots are so few. But um, there was a film called Roads in February, uh, a Quebecois uh, Latin film by uh, director Catherine Yurkovich which, um, you know, I saw in, in the submission pile and recommended it. And it kind of just sat around for a bit. Like I didn't get any feedback on it. And then I, you know, soon the, the last couple slots were available and I was like, hey, what's going on with this film? Like, have you guys watched it yet? And then finally, you know, they watched it and they're like, hey, yeah, this is good. And like, yeah, okay. So we got this like emergency slot to get the film in. And then it ended up winning the best first feature film that year the best uh, first Canadian feature film that year. So I felt like, you know, one relieved that we got it in, but also like a bit sort of vindicated in my uh, taste or whatever you want to call it, my work that, you know, other people felt the same way about it. Um, and the same thing happened too with a, a film from a couple of years ago called Antigone um, that we saw it. I really was felt really strong about it, but other people who, who were on the committee, you know, weren't as strong about it on it as I was. And I, and I felt like I kind of went on a limb and like took it like pretty early and invited it. And then it went, went on to win best Canadian feature, went on to win like a bunch of Canadian screen awards, like won other prizes, like at other festivals. And yeah, so I mean, I think when those moments happen, you're like, it, it reaffirms that like, hey, like, I know what I'm doing kind of thing. Because when you're in working in the arts, like, it's so subjective that people will challenge, like, you know, like, people have their own tastes, and they'll be like, hey, that movie sucked. Like, why are you, you know, but it's like, yeah, well, I'm not programming for you. I'm programming for audiences. And I think, yeah, this film might have some some flaws or but like, I know audiences are like, and so that's a, also the difference is like, I program for audiences. There are some people who, in my opinion, they program for critics. They program for, you know, intense cinephiles who are like, you know, are highly educated in film language. I program for audiences, like general audience, people who, um, you know, work hard to pay for that ticket, that price of admission. And so when I select a film, I don't want people to feel like they got ripped off. And um, so that's how I look at it. And, you know, and I'm not every program or curator is the same. And that's good. And you mentioned like kind of the analogy of like, you know, you're, there's a glamorous aspect to your job, but you do have to watch a lot of bad product or low quality product to find the good mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um, now on the flip side, if a, a filmmaker or potential filmmakers out there that want their dream is to kind of get a film with the TIFF one day, and you obviously have the lens of what uh, a film what kind of film will catch their attention? What's advice you would give them? I mean, other than obviously have a good product, but like, how do you necessarily do that? Or like, how do you find the right person to champion your, your film? Because like you said, some of these films, you have to kind of go through like folks like yourself or in your previous role to get to people that make those decisions around in your current role of which films get picked for TIFF. So like, how do you kind of do that? Or is it based on the year, the themes, the con you know, the political climate? Yeah, I mean, all of those factors certainly come into to consideration, you know, political, social climate, uh, things like that. It's hard to, like, I get this question a lot, and it's just impossible to answer, like, hey, these are the qualities you need. It's really, you know, it's like, it's a look, it's a feel, it's, um, but also the one thing that I try to say is, you know, subtlety is, is, is important. I find that the films that aren't that aren't in contention or that we see that are just not considered i think the i've tried to the overall sort of 
theme or characteristic of the films that are immediately sort of rejected are they're not original and it's like well what's it's just like they're just they seem too familiar there's nothing authentic or unique about the way it's presented but also there's something that is there's an element usually that's just so on the nose that the filmmakers don't trust the audiences to understand nuance and subtlety and and I think that those are the important things like you know it's like at the end of the day so many of the stories and films we watch are about the same thing but told in a different setting or with different characters or you know but there's something there is a lost art when it comes to subtlety and allowing your audience to think and make their own decisions and come to their own conclusions or you know keep them guessing and i think that's the one quality that i'm uh, i'm seeing a lot in in the films that you know just aren't uh, that are below average got it and so as you you know you're obviously the last question really around tiff is you've obviously seen it longer but like watching from a distance i've seen tiff become you know a less important film festival to arguably now being maybe the most or second most important film festival mm -hmm. in the world i'm not sure if you agree with that assessment but i've heard that quite a bit um, and you've been there for quite a bit of time, so you've probably seen this evolution. So number one, I guess, how, like, is this something that you, you've seen based on kind of the prestige that TIFF is getting? And number two, for you as someone working at TIFF, what has changed internally at TIFF as this progression has happened in terms of TIFF's you know, importance on the world stage in, in film festivals? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly TIFF is uh, one of the most, or if not the most important film festival in North America, for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I kind of came on board in 2013 and TIFF was already, you know, this big juggernaut of a festival. Um, I think it's immensely important for Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It's like, I think it's the biggest cultural event, you know, yearly cultural event uh, that our country offers in terms of just like in a normal non-pandemic year, the amount of different cultures and communities that are represented and all the people that are able to come in and, and the work and the stories that we're able to celebrate. And like, because, you know, obviously Toronto and Canada is such a multicultural country that it's amazing. And like the feeling that people get and the appreciation when, you know, they know that like there's a film from India, there's a film from Sri Lanka, there's a film from the Philippines, and they can go support that and they can go sit in a the theater and, you know, think about, you know, their time back home or their family back home. Like, I think those are important aspects of the festival. And of course, yeah, you know, uh, there's so much industry and, you know, when it's booming or, you know, with restaurants and hotels and tourism and like all that stuff is important. And it's, it's amazing to see like what happens when this well-oiled machine is running at full tilt and, you know, the streets closed down, like King Street's closed down. And there's all this like amazing like installations happening and like all these, there's all this, there's an intense buzz around the city, which is like the reason why, you know, you, people live in Toronto. Like, you know, it's just like when the Jays or the Raptors are like doing amazing, you know, there's that extra buzz in the city. And, you know, unfortunately we just haven't had that the last couple of years, we know with good reason. But um, yeah, I think the global, the national impact is, is super important. And yeah, I look forward to being able to, you know, work at TIFF again, hopefully 2022, when we're able to welcome all of these different communities, you know, showing these different works from all over and, and being able to have, you know, full capacities and having the audiences there to, to see their culture and their heritage represented on screen. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. The buzz was definitely not there this year, especially when you walk on King Street, when it used to be kind of pedestrian only, you see the TIFF sign, all that mm -hmm. kind of energy was missing, but uh, hopefully next year. Uh, we talked about kind of your TIFF experience and then I want to really quickly touch on the fact that you're also a programmer at Hot Docs. So yeah. again, why did you decide to kind of take that experience on um, and what attracted you to that particular opportunity? Yeah, well, I think the way that the film festival circuit works out is because, you know, so I'm not like a full-time employee at TIFF or at Hot Docs. Like I work a contract gig um, where it's like programming, watch the films, see the festival through. And so that allowed me, because I do that at TIFF, and then because I had, um, 
you know, I, the, the festival that I, I run in Sarnia, it allowed me that this space to be able to work at Hot Docs. So Shane Smith, the artistic director at Hot Docs, uh, he came over from TIFF. He used to run the shorts program, uh, the international shorts program there, and, you know, among other things. And, and you know, I, I, I think I didn't know Shane very well when uh, before he reached out to me, but um, you know, I think one of the important things about being uh, in the arts world is having a good reputation and, and being conscious of your reputation and how other people perceive you. Um, and so I, I imagine he heard good things. And, uh, you know, I, I pride myself on being an easy person to work with and being, you know, um, just like available and uh, things like that. So I think, um, you know, I think he... He, we set up an interview. It's like, hey, you know, we have this opportunity. And it came, same kind of deal with TIFF, like starting off as a programming associate. So that was in 2000, I think, 16, maybe. Just So I just started off watching, like, a uh, small number of films, recommending them up to the main programmers. And then uh, last year, I got made an official international features programmer. And, yeah, so, um, you know, look forward. The festival will be uh, at the end of May end of, or no, sorry, end of April, beginning of May, I believe. Um, and I mean, Hot Talks is super fun. I hope we're gonna be in a position because they, they, they've done now two online festivals in a row. So, I, you know, I think we're gonna be in a position to be back in theaters again. And Hot Talks is a great, it's a thriving, amazing festival. If folks who are listening haven't been, um, so many, so much important content and stories, socially, politically driven, and also entertaining too from around the world. And um, just, uh, it's not like, you know, it's not the like celebrity driven kind of festival that TIFF is, um, but it's a really amazing sort of started grassroots. And now it's evolved into this, like one of the biggest festivals in North America as well as in terms of documentary. Did you know that every time you left a five out of five review for this podcast, a Tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts? Okay, that's probably not true, but if there's a chance that it is, do you really want to jinx it? Leave a review. Do it for the young creative in you. And it's where the place where I got to, uh, you know, host and meet um, MIA and have a Q&A and discussion with her, which was super fun. That was awesome. Yeah, I saw that documentary, I think it was a couple of years ago. Great. great. Yeah, um, yeah. I liked her, but I think my perception of her changed definitely after I watched that documentary. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, she, I mean, I don't know how, like, I don't know if, what my perception of her was before, but she, you know, I think to get where she is to like, you know, like you have to have some certain character traits and certain uh, attitude and personality to get to that point from like, you know, um, but yeah, she definitely has a way of carrying herself that is not appealing to a lot of folks. Um, but I think like the one thing that you, that I have to admire about her is just like the drive and the persistence that that kind of a person needs to have. It's like that aspect is inspiring. Like, I mean, I'm, I don't think like the way like she sort of acted in the media and, and towards like other folks, particularly other BIPOC folks as well. Like I know she's drawn a lot of criticism for that, but um, I think just like overcoming some of that adversity and to get to that kind of a platform is like, is really remarkable. Well, that's, I think the power of film and storytelling is kind of controlling a narrative where mm. I think she's portrayed a certain way by the media to be a certain way. And this documentary I mean, she had a reason for making it, but it also kind of gave her a chance to control the narrative about her, which was, yeah. here's what was said about me, but here's why. It's kind of like the Michael Jordan documentary. Yeah, I was just going to I was just gonna bring up the last dance. Because, yeah. you know, like, if you weren't a Jordan fan before that, after watching it, like, obviously he was a big part of it. He got a lot of creative control around it. And the end yeah. product is very much favorable around how he was as a basketball player, how he was a person. So that's just the power of film, I think, just gives you an opportunity. It, um, yeah. It is interesting and like, I mean, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but like the whole control of the narrative, which is like, you want a documentary to be completely objective and to tell both sides, like, you know, both good or bad. But I think we're seeing this shift in, well, if you're telling the story that I haven't 
given full consent to, like, that's actually like, we're going to cancel this documentary. And like, we've seen that just recently with the Alanis Morissette documentary where she was like, I didn't give full consent to this. And so like, it's then becomes denounced and in the press and things like that. And it, that, I mean, I, I do agree with you that the documentary should always be objective, but then there's this line, well, like if you, I'm not giving the consent to the story, then it shouldn't be told. I'm gonna, I don't know if you would know this. I'm just curious, maybe it's a legal question, but if somebody decides to make a, do- say I decide to make a documentary about you after this conversation, yeah. you don't like it. Do you have a right to stop me from like releasing it? Like it's my opinion of you. I thought it was like a, almost like a news piece similar to that, or is that, is that not the case? Yeah, I don't know. I think it would have to, it would definitely have, I mean, I'm sure Alanis Morissette or whoever else like would have had her lawyers involved in, in pre-production and there must have been several contracts signed. Hmm. But I think, you know, there are always like unauthorized documentaries being released. You know, recently, I think the Tiger Woods documentary was sort of unauthorized. Um, so I don't know how legally that works, but like, I know that at least in the Elena Morset documentary, from what I know, there was no consideration of like pulling the film, mm-hmm. at least from our end. Um, HBO, who had the rights, like they could have said, hey, we need to pull this film because blah, blah, blah. Atlantis isn't happy, you know, that kind of thing. But um, that was never, in that example, that was never an option. I that was curious, never in consideration. Because I think of like the movie, I forgot what it's called, Social Network, I think with about like Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think he kind of, uh, was part of that process so I was just curious no, about the legality no. um, so now kind of going into you know we, you know you kind of mentioned this earlier the film festival that you run SWIFT um, you know I guess it makes a bit more sense now that you're kind of contract for both but still it seems like you have a lot on your plate so on top of like being a programmer for two different well-known film festivals you decided to start your own film festival um, and now I think it's in its seventh or eighth year so what made you decide to you know, start this film festival because building something from scratch is you know super difficult, uh, very entrepreneurial, I would say. So, why did you do it? What's the impact of this film festival? Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I uh, the film festival started in 2015, so I was already two years into working at TIFF, um, and I was still working at Real Canada. And I had Real Canada was an organization that the two people who run it, Jack Bloom and Sharon Corner, they built from the ground up, very grassroots. So I, working with Real Canada, I got to see and learn like the ins and outs of building something and like the kind of like funding that you need, like where the funding comes from, the kind of documents you need. Like I had like, we everything was just like on a Google Drive. So I was able to see like, oh, this is what, this is a funding doc. This is how you get funding. So I started being like, hey, like I have access now to like, films and filmmakers like there's a few films that are like I could like bring them to you know Sarnia there wasn't a film festival in Sarnia and like it it seemed like a perfect pair to a perfect match to sort of you know get this going and like also I felt like it would I knew that there would be like it would help jumpstart my career a little bit if I if it were successful and um but also you know there was a small element too where I was watching like a lot of my colleagues at TIFF, they were like going to all these like international festivals like Cannes and Berlin and, you know, Sundance. And like, I wasn't getting the opportunities to do that. So like actually starting SWIFT was like an amazing way to like, yes, bring like international stories, like bring this amazing event to the community. But it also helped me get to these places that I, that these doors were, that felt close to me. So it kind of like, when I was working at TIFF, I was like the second year of SWIFT, I was like, I'm gonna go look for films like at all these other festivals. And I just was like, you know, told TIFF, I was like, hey, I'm going to this festival. And they're like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, will you give me accreditation? I paid for, you know, my way. And I used like SWIFT like to get in because you need a badge, like you need to be with a festival. So I was able to use SWIFT. And then after that TIFF was like, okay, well, we'll start sending you now. So, you know, it was kind of just like a, a way to like kick the door open a bit. And then they're like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, you're, it would be valuable if you're there and like watching stuff. And so that was sort of, there was like, it was half like, hey, this is a great opportunity for Sarnia. We can do something, bring like build arts and culture. And we have, and it's great. But then there's also like, I think every entrepreneurial thing is like, hey, you want to benefit the community at large, but also like, what am I like getting out of it myself? 
No, I, I love it because um, the analogy maybe I, I think of in my head is, you know, if I'm the person that sometimes organizes things with friends and, you know, sometimes things don't happen unless you do it. So if you're like, hey, I want to do this regardless if you're coming or not. And then you do it. People are like, oh, they're actually, it's actually happening because people are used to yeah. falling apart. So I just love the yeah. fact that, you know, you felt like these doors were close to you. You're like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to just create my own opportunity. And whether or not they like it, I'm going. So they might as yeah. well send me in their name instead of my own festival. Or I don't know how you did it, but I just love yeah. that because um, yeah. I think that, you know, like it goes back to the, the thing we talked about at the beginning where I feel like people think things should be handed to them versus kind of earned or like, you know, it'd be great if the world worked like that, but you know, the things worth having take a lot of, you know, take a lot of work and, you know, creativity. For sure. And so. Yeah. It was, I mean, it, and it was a lot of work. It was like, you know, long, a lot of long nights, long hours, like going to work, doing your normal job and then coming home and just like, okay, I'm working on Swift and I'm doing this until like one in the morning. Yep. And that's really what it was. And like, yeah, it, you know, um, but, and also like for anyone who's like, like, it took like a lot of like, when you're trying to start something that's sort of big, a little bit big in scale, or like, you know, you have to have three or four or five people that really believe in it and are going to help you and see your vision out. Like, there's no way, like if it, I, it, it'd been impossible if it was just me. So that was like another thing too. And anyone who's, you know, thinking about starting like their own festival or their, you know, the same thing is with like making a movie, you know, like you have an idea, you have a script now you need like four or five people to believe in the story, believe in the project who are going to help you. And like in the first couple of years, do it for free. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't pay myself the first two years. Like I was paying everybody else, but I was doing it all for free. Cause I knew like, I can't pay myself. Like what I, you know, you have to get this off the ground first. And it wasn't until year three when we finally had like some secure funding. I was like, okay, now I can pay myself for this work that I'm doing. And so, yeah, so I guess yeah, there's sacrifices that you have to make when you're trying to do something like that. That's awesome. You know, just around the topic of film festivals in general, um, and I guess it's movies, but what role do you think film festivals, do you think they'll be as important, especially as kind of the movie or film industry is kind of changing where you're seeing a lot of things go to stream first versus, you know, like in theater. I know that's kind of changing with some of the big movies that have come out the last couple mm -hmm. of weekends, but do you see like this trend of movies going to be streamed first versus kind of in theater a permanent thing or is this something that's temporary or like to be determined still I, I don't know I'm just curious yeah like I I mean I don't know but you know the Netflix Netflix definitely does not want to go back to cinema uh their whole model is to just get people to stream films um, but I know the distributors like in Canada, they want people to go back to theaters. And so I think there's definitely going to be, there's going to be a divide in terms of, you know, your Netflix films are going to stay on Netflix and those films will probably, in my opinion, probably be harder to get to play at festivals, but there's, you know, then, but there'll be a slew of amazing other films that aren't Netflix films or, um, you know, even Amazon, they're still, they're still supporting uh, films and theaters. So um It'll be interesting to see how the festival shapes out in terms of size in the next few years. But I think, you know, there's definitely an appetite to go back to cinema. Like we just started selling tickets for the festival in Sarnia and people are buying, like there's, there's an interest to be back and, and gather again. Like, you know, I, we're naturally, we want, yes, we're accustomed to being at home and doing Zoom like this and, you know, but there's also an innate desire to get together and, and be together uh, like, you know, I just bought some concert tickets, you know, today and I'm excited. So I think, you know, it, it is nice to just be able to stay at home and, and stream something. But I think people, especially now more than ever, are looking for opportunities to go out and, and to get together with friends and family. And I think a movie is still going to be one of those things. You know, you've chosen, you come from an Asian family. Like I know both your parents are from parts of Asia and mm -hmm. having a career in film or the arts typically... I know it's slowly changing, but it's typically not, you know, the thing that your parents get excited about, um, mm -hmm. or like even friends are like, they don't really understand it. So um, I guess what kind of reaction have you had kind of throughout this journey from like friends and family about your professional choice to make a full-time living around film? Yeah, um, I think like my friends are very much used to it and like, kind of like, oh, this is what Ravi does, you know? Like I very much more like I always try to like include my friends in the stuff that I'm doing. Like if I have like 
if I'm able to get tickets, like I'm inviting my friends, to like, hey, come see this film I'm introducing at TIFF or at Hot Docs. Um, and then Swift, you know, I try to make it just like a big like party, like, you know, invite like all my friends, bring people in from Toronto to come, hey, come see what Sarnie's all about, that kind of thing. So I think like, you know, family, um, you know, sadly, uh, both of my parents didn't get the opportunity to like see where like what I'm doing or like what I've become because they both passed away uh, wow. when I was still when I was still in university. But, you know, my mom was a chemist. My father was a, a chemical engineer. Um, and but my mom always supported uh, me pursuing the arts. Um, you know, she always went to like all the theater plays that I was in and like all that stuff. And I think like from my experience, like my mom came over here and like, you know, had a great job, great paying job. And, you know, but like didn't really like her job, didn't enjoy what she was doing, but like worked hard and made good money to be able to, you know, being a single mother and being able to support like two kids. Like, I think she was happy that she could do you know, something that she didn't really particularly like because it allowed me to do something and pursue something that I did like. And I think, you know, if she were to be able to see the kind of stuff that I'm doing, like going to like TIFF events and like, you know, being front row at like some Q and A with like whoever, MIA or whatever, um, you know, I think she would take great pride in that, like the hard work that she put in this is the fruits of her labor, like somebody who her son doesn't have to like, you know, work a 12 hour shift job, that kind of thing, you know? I think that's what uh, she would take benefit in. Yeah, it's a beautiful story kind of around that saying they say, sometimes, you know, the, 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 the seeds you plant, you don't get to see the shade from the tree or whatever, I'm messing up, Yeah, seed, you know what I mean? So, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's beautiful. Um, and you, you know, you talked a lot about kind of contract and like money and just kind of, thinking about money constantly because of kind of the nature of your jobs and things like that. So what is your relationship with like money and like what advice would you give to people thinking about getting into the world of film and making some kind of living around it because especially if they enjoy it because finances, although we don't want to talk about it, it's an important part of enabling this kind of, you know, um, life. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like the first few years, uh, like I would say, so I got out of school like 2010, I would say, you know, from 2010 to 2017, we're like financially like paycheck to paycheck, living in like, you know, kind of like a rustic old apartment and, but like living, like, I mean, I'm, I wasn't like super struggling, like, and I was able to like, be able to have like, you know, have some fun, but like, you know, I, but I also, I like, I know a lot of friends who have like kids and like, you know, have like own homes and stuff. Like, I don't, I don't own, I live in Toronto, I don't own a home I rent but I'm financially comfortable at this point, but it's a hustle, you know, it's like, I work, I have two contract jobs. I do three swift, you know, I have three contract jobs and then I pick up all these little side, you know, things like, you know, opportunity speaking or whatever, maybe being on a panel, that's like whatever, but like I have other side hustles too, you know, that are totally unrelated to film because like I, it's, it, I have that kind of like, like I have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit so I have other hobbies and interests that are also like, you know, revenue generating. And, um, and so, I mean, in terms of my advice, it's just like, you know, I like what I'm doing. I'm having fun. It's not super stressful at all. Like I do take, I do, I'm, you know, I work all the time, but I enjoy that. Like, I don't mind answering emails at like midnight. Like that's just something that like, I like, like, I don't like doing it, but like, I don't like, it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? Cause like, I just want the work to get done and the job to get done. So my advice is like, you know, someone told me when I was like coming out of films, it was like either, you know, the job that you're doing, the career, either you're making a million bucks or you love what you're doing. And if you're not making a million bucks or, and you don't love what you're doing, then you got something wrong. So I'm not making a million bucks, but I, I'm having fun. I enjoy what I'm doing. I get to meet new and interesting people all the time. And so that's okay with me. Um, and advice so like I mean I wish I'd gotten better financial advice when I was in high school and things like that like where to like you know invest money in. and it took later in life to really like discover those and really discovering those on my own um but yeah I mean if you're if you're young if you're like 18 19 like I want to get in the film industry I want to be a programmer you're not doing it for money 
<laughs> uh, you're doing it because you, you're doing it because you love film and you you love discovering new voices and you you know that you have a talent or a gift for finding music or film that like people also enjoy. Like I think I realized that like a, a young age. Like I was always the kid in high school, like organizing like film screenings, like putting on dances and like you know doing like putting on like concerts. So like I was just naturally like drawn to like you know gathering people and like showing people hey this is what I'm into like you might be into it too and that's what like I feel programming is about um so yeah like if you like that then you know if that's what you're into like curating them you know but there are ways to you know I've seen a lot of programmers like you know like Cameron Bailey was a programmer he was a critic and a programmer and now he's the head of TIFF like that's an amazing you know you look at something like Rad as a critic and now look at all these opportunities he has you know on tv and things like that so um you know there are there are ways to make it in the arts and you just have to find your like your niche and you know what you're really good at and um yeah and then you know i think there'll be uh, opportunities for you so you get a chance to go in a time machine you're sitting with 16 year old ravi what do you tell him Money can be hard to come by, but here is a $100 opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win $100 when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? Um, don't drop out of calculus. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if I was 16 again, I don't like, I don't, I definitely don't have any regrets about the path that I've taken, but I don't know if there was something else that I would redo. I mean, I think if I had it over again, I would just because it's my spirit, like I would probably pick something new just to have a different life experience um, and like have that kind of adventure. Like I'd probably be like, hey, you should like I probably would pursue something in like sports management. Like I'd probably be like, yeah, like I want to be the GM of the like Toronto Raptors. Like I want to run like so I like the idea of like running a film company, but maybe I'd want to try something different, a different adventure, like running a sports team or like running, you know, whatever. Maybe I'd get more interested back in high school in like computer programming and I'd run like a startup, tech startup, I don't know. But I think just my adventurous spirit, if I, if someone was like, hey, we're gonna let you start over again, I probably would pick, uh, I'd probably zig instead of zag. And if you're forward looking, what's the legacy you wanna leave behind? Like, how do you wanna be remembered by friends and family? Yeah, I mean, nothing really about my work. Um, I would like, I mean, I want to be remembered from friends and family, uh, somebody that, you know, was like dependable, always there for them, like would always like pick up the phone or like drive over if something was wrong. Like that kind of stuff is what is important to me and like what I hope people like, you know, like, you know, I know like if, if I died tomorrow, what people will say like, oh, he was like a, you know, he was like a fun dude and like, you know, was like whatever you know always like I but like my my legacy is like I I, I like I want to be remembered as someone who brought people together like brought different people together too like different thoughts and ideas and personalities and beliefs like you know I have I have that in my friend group just because of where I come from and now where I'm living so just totally you know like I don't know different different ideologies different beliefs and so I like bringing those kind of people together and sticking them in a room and like oh what's your commonality well obviously there's something about you that Ravi likes so maybe we'll have something in common I've actually found some joy in like bringing like Toronto folks down to Sarnia and having them mix with Sarnia folks because it's a different it's like a bit of a different world you know when you go to like small town Canada where like you know things are people think a bit differently compared to like you know downtown Toronto so, um, yeah, I don't know. I think I just want to be remembered as somebody that was a good person that was dependable and, um, you know, reliable and a great, great listener. Yeah. There's something romantic about uh, small town living. Um, yeah. When you, especially when you watch these shows like Schitt's Creek and like a few others where you kind of yeah. see that. I, I don't know if I could actually, cause I grew up in a big city all my life, but there is something, a romantic draw or something that draws you there. Um, you know, you, we, we talked about it before we kind of, you know, started the podcast, but you mentioned kind of, you know, um, not feeling as connected to the Tamil community as say other folks that kind of mm -hmm. you know, are in the, in the middle of like, you know, growing up in Scarborough, wherever it is, where there's a huge Tamil community. So how can like, what is your connection to the, you know, the Tamil community and like, I guess, understanding your roots, uh, maybe you know, briefly touch on that. Yeah, I mean, sadly, it's it's very little as of right now, um, but I'm hoping to change that. But essentially, 
So, you know, I always, I always, you know, knew that half of my heritage. So my father died when I was really young, he died when I was two. So I was raised by my mother, my Filipino mother. So I was raised, you know, like for all intents and purposes in a Filipino household. Like my Lola lived with me. Filipino food was all around, went to all these Filipino functions. Yeah, like, and my father was the only person from his family that came to Canada. So we like, you know, just kind of lost touch with the whole bad half of my family. But like, I knew where he was from and like, I knew, you know, uh, what his background was and things like that. But, um, and then it wasn't until TIFF where I was like going to this event and Rad was like working the door at this like critics side function event and he, I was like telling my name and like he we kind of knew each other where we exchanged emails like oh he's like he's like are you Tamil and I was like um like um I'm Indian and he was like no you have a very Tamil name I was like oh I don't know my dad I think I said something stupid like oh well I'm pretty sure my dad was like Hindu he's like oh that doesn't really matter like Tamil. and I was like and then I kind of was like oh like I don't know I was like I feel stupid right now Cause so then I kind of like went and looked stuff up and then I was talking to Arun and Arun was like, yeah, that's like a very Tamil. And then the whole MIA thing was happening at Hot Talks. And so like, I, as I mentioned earlier, my brother is 11 years older than me. So like he has, like, he remember, like, I don't remember my dad, like you're too, you don't remember like anything. Like he grew up with, you know, with my dad around and stuff like that. And so he's got like, he's like kind of like a keeper of all this information knowledge. And sometimes he'll just like drop something like so, like like fucked like out of nowhere where you're like what why didn't you say tell me that and so i'm telling him about this mia thing and i'm like yeah like you know her dad is like a leader of the tamil tiger he's like oh he's like oh yeah yeah we're tamil and i was like what and he's like yeah dad he's tamil. and i'm like what do you like and he's nothing we never like he never brought up or ever talked about or anything like that before and um and just like other stuff too you know other like family stuff and so you know, started researching and then we contacted uh, one of our cousins who was like the son of my dad's sister. He lives in upstate New York and we started chatting with him on Facebook and like wanting to meet up. And so now we have this sort of connection that's like in, you know, like relatively close. And we were, you know, and we were talking about the whole like, you know, Tamil community and things like that. And we were like, had a schedule to meet up in New York. We were gonna, my brother and I were gonna drive to his place in New York and then the pandemic hit. And so we're still waiting for that opportunity to like sort of one, like explore and find out more about our family. Cause it's really a bit of an unsolved mystery for me personally, because like my brother, when he was younger, had the opportunity to go to India and like meet the family and things like that. And I just didn't have that opportunity. Just sort of really lost contact um, to an entire half of my heritage. Oh, wow. So look, yeah, yeah. So looking forward to um, meeting with my cousin in New York and sort of, you know, getting, you know, that, information and you know heritage uh you know for hopefully happens sooner than later yeah and before we kind of go to the last segment just to kind of add some context for you guys listening of how i connected with ravi was that i went to a movie called night raiders that he was hosting and uh, I, like like rad i saw your name and i was like i think he's tamil but then i posted <laughs> on social media and our i guess our mutual tamil friend arun um, said, hey, I think that's Ravi. And I was like, hey, is Ravi Tamil? And I think he's like, yeah, I think he is. And that's kind of how we connected. So it's pretty random, random connection. I feel like in the Tamil community, one thing I learned is that it's not the typical six, to, six degrees of separation between any two Tamil people. I think in the Tamil community, it's like two degrees of separation. And right. the story of how we met proves that. So kind of going into the final part of the conversation, it's a, a segment that I like to call Creator Confessions. I'm basically going to say a bunch of statements. You're going to tell me the first thing that pops to mind, and it's kind of intended to be a speed round. So you ready, okay. Ravi? I'll try. I'll try, yeah. Uh, favorite Tamil food? <laughs> uh, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I I don't know. Is, is Chana a Tamil food? Like Chana masala? I don't know if it's, I know it's South, I guess it's South India. That's a great question. I actually don't know. Uh, okay. The common, the common uh, answers I often get are like mutton rolls, kotroti, or like dosa, things like that. But okay, yeah. well, I do love dosa, but I think you'll, you or Arun will have to take me out and give me the full like Tamil cuisine experience. One hundred percent. Something that scares you. Uh, death. An insecurity that you have. Uh, being wrong. Favorite show you're watching. 
I actually just watched, started rewatching The Sopranos, so I'll go with that. But a new uh, new show, I would say Succession. Um, place you're itching to travel to after the pandemic is over? India. Uh, a fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? Fellow Tamil creator. Well, you had Maya on your show, I saw, but uh, she's a filmmaker that I've sort of just started um uh you know get, getting to know through email and things like that so if you haven't checked out uh maya's work uh or listened to uh our and maya's conversation um there's also a filmmaker on the rise who's working on a piece on the logo named chloe abraham okay. so uh, she's a programmer turned filmmaker so if uh, you know you can google chloe and uh you know follow her work as well Favorite childhood memory? Wow. Um, uh, I would say like maybe the first time I ever like acted in a play, I, I was playing, I was in The Sound of Music hmm. and I was playing uh, Sam Detweiler, who's like the kind of comic relief uh, character in that play. And like, so, I mean, if you can imagine like, I'm wearing like, a, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm like a, kind of a chubby, I'm a chubby guy and I was a chubby kid. And so like, I just have this ridiculous like plaid suit on and like, you know, adult makeup on. And like, uh, in hindsight at the time, I was like, oh yeah, this is normal. But like, I just, and like, I'm the only brown kid at, at this like all white Catholic school and we're doing this play. And then I, I, as soon as I walked out on stage, everyone started laughing. I hadn't even <laughs> delivered any lines yet. And I was like, I remember being a kid and being like, what? Like, I haven't even done anything yet. Why is everyone laughing? And like, I think in hindsight, I was like, oh, it's like, well, yeah, like you're like this like little brown boy, chubby boy playing this like old white, like uh, <laughs> Jewish, old white Jewish character. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then, but that kind of gave me the, the bug of like making people laugh and like, you know, getting like, you know, being on stage and stuff like that. So I think that's like a memory that I'll always have. Something you like to do for fun outside of work? Well, I like to go to I, I like to go to live music. I used to go to a lot of festivals when I was younger, and I'm like kind of an old man. Um, but uh, I I've just got I collect uh, I collect sports. I, I got into the I don't know if people listening like the whole like NFT crypto thing. Well, kind of with that like big burst is also this renaissance in sports cards. So I collected a lot of like basketball, hockey cards, football cards when I was a kid. And there's just like, it, they've come back and like in full force. And so, yeah, like I flip, I flip sports cards on the side and it's been super fun because I love sports. And it's also like really nostalgic. Like I've, I dug up a lot of the cards I had when I was a kid and then I like had like a Kobe Bryant rookie card uh, and like an Allen Iverson rookie card that were like in really good shape. And, so it's just kind of been like this childhood nostalgic trip, but also just like a fun way to kind of like make a bit of money too. Do you follow Gary Vee at all? I do, yeah. <laughs> it's huge. I feel like COVID really accelerated this nostalgia play. Like I it saw did. so much stuff. I think like obviously NFTs, NFTs kind of help, but I saw a lot of these old school brands kind of coming. Yeah. I know he's a huge fan of these old school brands. He's trying to like revive a bunch of them, but I yeah, think yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I haven't got into the NFT world. Like, I wish I could. Or I mean, like, it's just not. I kind of, I can't flip stuff that I don't like that I'm not passionate about. Like, you know, like I'm not buying like soccer cards or F1 racing cards because I'm just not into those things. Like, I'm, I'm like, I love basketball, I love football, I like baseball, and so those are the kind of three things I'm into. I just love the NFT idea. I think it's going to be bigger than people think it is because it oh. is the creator control of like you know that example that people totally is like you know somebody creates a painting 10 years down the line you know they explode in popularity they don't get to capture resale value with nfts you can kind of every time it's sold or resold they're getting a piece of that action and i just Absolutely. even like for athletes or like filmmakers like there's so much opportunities out there um, for sure filmmakers for sure filmmakers, absolutely ton of opportunities um around yeah there. Uh, maybe like a new way for them to fundraise, like, you know, maybe an NFT pass to get them behind mm -hmm. the stage or you know, be a director for the day. Like so much opportunities. Yeah, um, absolutely. What's a purchase you've made recently in the last couple of years that you've splurged on, but you have zero regret about? 
Um, well, I guess I'll have to go back to, yeah, I don't, I don't really buy a lot of things. Like I don't know, like, but like the card thing. So in 2019, this was before the pandemic, I had just started. So I kind of got in a bit early on the card thing because it exploded during the pandemic. But I bought, I was like, I'm like, who, like, who do I love? And like, what's like, it's, you know, so I, I'm a big Steph Curry guy, love mm -hmm. Steph Curry. So I bought his rookie card, his PSA 10, which is the highest graded rookie card. And I splurred, it was like a lot. I just paid 500 American for it. And, it's a great and then I, yeah. And then I sold it at the middle of the pandemic. And I won't say, I don't, maybe I shouldn't reveal how much it sold for. And I, I can then, imagine how much it sold for. <laughs> I, it sold, I, it was a lot of, there was a lot of profit on it. But then like six months later, that number doubled. Oh man, crazy. So it was one of those things where like, oh man, but you know, the lesson if you're an entrepreneur flipping is you can never go broke taking a profit. Yeah. Um, so that's, but it was, but since then I've actually acquired like other Steph Curry, but like, that was the one thing that I splurged on. I took a chance on and like, and sort of believe, and it's kind of with the whole like film festival, like you think you, you know, if you know something and you really believe it, you should take a risk on it. And I took a risk on this card. And because I was like, I think he's undervalued. Uh, it was also at a time when they were on the downturn in terms of like the team and things like that. Like, anyway, this is off like creator topic, but took a risk on it. And then, but he's going to go down as, you know, one of like the most important basketball players of all time, the way that he changed the game. And so, you know, when you find things like that, where you're like, oh, this is, you know, I, I know something and it's the whole, the rest of the market hasn't, you know, figured it out yet. It's kind of a good feeling. No, no, I, I agree with you on two things. Number one, I mean, I think the thing that I don't do is I don't do flips. I like to do buy and hold. Uh, mm. for this, you know, even like when I invest in like the stock market, I, I don't like invest in stocks. I just put it into like an index fund, the most easiest thing. Uh, but number two is like the point you made about paper profits. People love to talk about that, whether it's like real estate, et cetera, but those don't pay the bills. You know, like you, you might've, you could have made more money. It's easy yeah. to do that when you kind of look back, but you could have easily gone down as well. So um, money isn't real unless it's in your pocket doing something for you. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Uh, pet peeve. Man, I've got a lot. Um, pet peeve. It's like, I don't know, maybe cockiness. Hmm. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, I regret that you would have. Uh, not telling people like close to me that like I love them and care about them and like what they've meant to me. Age you want to retire by. And my definition of retiring is ownership of time, doing what you want when you want. Maybe you're already there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not fully there, but I, 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 to be honest, I don't think I could ever like fully retire. Like, I, I feel like, yeah, if someone was like, "Hey, Ravi, you want to come with me to Hawaii?" Like, all expenses paid. Like, I probably couldn't go right now because of like work obligations. But I'm also just not a person who could be like 50 and just like sit around and like lay on a beach 24/7. Like, I'm just not wired that way, and maybe I need to change that. I don't know, but. I am somebody who always wants to be doing something or else like I kind of get myself in trouble. Yeah, I think that's why I said I preface that with, I don't think <laughs> retirement, I don't think anybody, like a lot of people moving forward will do like that whole doing nothing. I think retirement will be like just doing what you want whenever you want. So if there's a job that you absolutely love and you do it for free, I mean, yeah. yeah, you know, just, I think that's what it was. Well, like. yeah. if it was like something, yeah, like if it was something like, you know, where I was able to build myself to have like 10 properties and that's how I'm, and all I'm doing is like managing or like, you know, you know, whatever, then yeah, I would say like, I mean, 50 would be nice. Yeah. It doesn't seem realistic though for me. <laughs> you got to shoot for the stars. Um, yeah. A celebrity whose life you want to experience for one day. I would, I mean, current, I would say like, if I could go back in the past, I'd probably say Michael Jordan um current oh, i don't know maybe uh donald trump uh, that's a good one <laughs> uh and the final and I, I mean i'm not and i'm not saying that because like i like donald trump i'm so, he, like yeah that's all i'll say i just think like that oh, no, definitely be... <laughs> I, I think somebody else gave me an answer similar where like they said for this question you know most people probably say this or this but he's like i would want to go to i would want to be in the brain of somebody that i would probably don't like or like somebody crazy, like where people would see us crazy because 
you want to just know how their brain works, how their day is. Totally. I want to just see how absurd it is, you yeah. know, like to spend a day in the life of when he was president. Like, I think it would have just been interesting, like to actually see what kind of things he like said and had to deal with and what other people had to deal with. You know? yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and the last question is um, just kind of a, a public service announcement you want to leave our audience with or just advice that you feel like somebody should be hearing as a way to kind of end off the podcast. Um, yeah, I would just say like always trust, trust your instincts, uh, trust, like have people around you that you really trust their opinion, but like that aren't just like, yes, people like you want no people, uh, in your life. So you can see the other side. Um, and don't take criticism or of your work or your ideas personally. Uh, that's something that I am struggling all the time to work through uh is to you know criticism is needed and important and it doesn't mean like hey your idea or your work sucks it just means like someone else sees it differently and just don't take it personally and i'm trying to do that all the time we're trying to work on that all the time great advice ravi this was an awesome podcast i think i want to thank you for kind of jumping on and sharing your really remarkable story uh what is the best way for someone to reach out to you uh, yeah, I mean, they can find me on Instagram at Rav Srinivas, so R-A-V-S-R-I-N-I-V-A-S. Uh, you can like DM me there and like we can, you know, set up a chat or, you know, email that way. That would probably be the easiest way. Awesome. Well, thank you again for hopping on for the audience. Appreciate you guys listening as always. Look forward to the next episode. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. Take care.